morning. Everyone wants to find a seat. We're going to get rolling here. Good morning. Good morning. All right, folks. Uh, what we're going to discuss this morning is a few of the uh, strategies about navigating our creative marketing. Okay. So let me start with a couple questions. Could I get a show of hands in the room? And how many are first time or first three time attendees? Okay, great, okay. Yeah. How many in the room have uh, been coming to our conferences for at least two years, three years, four years, over five? Okay, good. All right, so can I get a show of hands how many client represented brokers are in the room. In other words, you're representing a client's inventory versus your own account. Okay? All right. Um, how many are representing both clients and your own inventory? Great. That's good. That's a good sign. Okay. So the reason I ask these questions is for those of us that are new to equity marketing, to our type of exchange conferences, be aware that this is kind of like your general brokerage on steroids, okay? So how many places can you go where you have an entire room of potential takers or buyers for that property that know no geographical boundaries, okay? So what this course is designed to do is introduce certain time management skills, introduce certain processes that I've used personally Everybody has to find their own method, right? Everybody's got their own way of doing business, their own way of follow up. But hopefully, you know, our objective here today, and, and this is going to be, you know, skipping around a little bit. Uh, what we're trying to accomplish is we're trying to introduce an idea of different strategies so that you can be more productive at the meetings, get more proposals, and turn those proposals, most important here, turn those proposals into transactions that close, okay? So, before I get started, a quick story, quick testimonial uh, about what we do and how it worked for me, okay? And I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room um, that has a story similar to this. How many in the room were caught off guard by the recession? Okay. How many people lost everything? Okay. All right. For those that didn't, okay, there were obviously good lessons that we took from that, okay? I was a real estate investor starting in the late 80s, more prominently in the early 90s. Uh, we had built a pretty measurable portfolio of properties. I, I think some of us, uh, Chuck, Chuck knows my former self from uh, SEC days. Um, when the recession hit, you know, I could do no wrong, right? Buy a property when everything's on the upswing, you leverage it, call the bank, Tell them to turn on the printing presses, give us a call when the money's dry, we'll come pick it up, okay? I could not make a mistake, okay? Everything I touched was turning to gold, okay? But I was smart enough that I needed to have an exit strategy plan. I've always been big on preparing for unknowns, okay? So then the recession hits, and I get this call one day from the bank, and they said, you know, we really appreciate the 19 years of business that you've provided us. We looked at our books, you know, you have over $20, $20 million worth of uh, personally guaranteed loan exposure. Uh, I just wanted to let you know the world's changed. And could you stop in next Friday and clear those loans off, please? Oh, yikes. I said, oh, okay. Uh, the answer to that, of course, was no. Um, and, and there were some creative adjectives thrown in between that conversation. But what ensued thereafter was about four years of litigation, okay? Now, all my exit strategies, all my what ifs, were predicated on time. And, and this is probably the biggest area that we're gonna address, time management, okay? So if the recession only lasted a year, six out of my eight exit strategies would have worked, okay? If it would have only lasted two years, half of my strategies would have worked. As it grinded on into five, six, seven years, Okay, and it took four years to die, let alone rebuild it. 
uh, none of my strategies worked. So I had to make a determination. Am I gonna file bankruptcy or am I gonna work my way through this somehow, some way, when I'm dealing with an environment where banks aren't lending, credit's been tagged, I've got creditors calling me by the hour, not by the uh, day, okay? So how am I gonna do this? Well, way back in the day when I first got started in real estate, I went to work for a gentleman named Ken Vidar. Many of you in the room know Ken. He'll be at the uh, April, July, and October meeting. And Ken was my mentor. And you know, he kept telling me along the way, you know, there's gonna come a time, Mike, when the banks stop giving you money. And you really ought to come down to these creative marketing meetings and you ought to see what we do. And I said, well, why? All I gotta do is call the bank and ask for money and they just turn on the printing presses and call me when it's dry, okay? So that kind of hit, hit home for me about year four of the recession. And uh, all of a sudden I started saying, okay, I need a solution here. I made the determination I'm not going to file bankruptcy. I'm gonna figure out a way to work through and salvage some of my equity in a huge portfolio of real estate that you know, we'll just, for rounding purposes, say had well north of $20 million worth of personally guaranteed debt, okay? So this course, and the reason I tell this story, this course is basically a summary of how I worked my way without bankruptcy through this burden that I needed to carry and I needed to resolve, okay? So in retrospect, would it have been better for me to file bankruptcy? Uh, probably not, and, and this is not a financial statement. This is a relationship statement, okay? How many people came to this meeting to create a transaction? Okay, show of hands, how many people came here to build a relationship? There you go. All right, so the latter is going to take care of the former, okay? So what we're interested in doing is building a portfolio of relationships okay, that lead to multiple transactions, not just a single deal getting done in a meeting. Okay? The deals are a byproduct, okay? They're gonna occur. Okay, is Jad in here, Jad Wolf? Are you in here? Okay. So Jad was the first time attending in October. I'm gonna go ahead and, and bring him up because Here's a guy that came in here, first time attendee, uh, in October pitched a, a fairly large portfolio multifamily, went under contract at the meeting, closed before Christmas. Needless to say, he's on board, right? Okay, so, so that's the objective here. We wanna share the principles. So why are we here, okay? Obviously, we wanna make some money, okay? We have things that we need to do, we're brokers, or we're principals acting on our own account, okay? Maybe you're here because you want to ex expand the audience of people that can gain exposure to what you're offering. Maybe your local market isn't responding to this and you're looking for somebody with a specialty that fits the dynamics of why I should own that property, okay? So, who do we have in the room that are ground up developers? Okay, Chuck, name? Scott. Scott. Dan. Dan. Okay, Dan, you're, you have a background in that, right? Horizontal construction. Okay, so how many are presenting raw land that is prime for development? Okay, so would any, would any of you find benefit having somebody that's willing to be the feet on the ground and go in and do all the horizontal and get these ready to take them from paper lots to marketable assets? Yes? Okay, so it's really important that you spend time at the socials, okay? Get to know these people, get to know what their background is, get to know what they do. Is Blake in the room, Blake Allen? Okay, so, so Blake is going to uh, be doing an opening segment and quick pitches, and I don't know if he's planning on starting with introductions in the room. We normally have somewhere in the 50s in January for attendance. Uh, we have about 85 people coming, so obviously big growth. You know, uh, the organization's growing, that's great. This is our smallest meeting of the year. For those that are first time attendees, use this as your preparation, because come April, everything goes to fast forward, okay? It's, it's January, uh, again, on steroids. There's 120 plus people generally in the room, and uh, things go at a much quicker pace. 
this particular conference, we're going to have a real easy time of it. It's the perfect size to be able to spend more time on packages, dig deeper, okay? So uh, maybe you're here to identify some new opportunities. How many came as a buyer broker or as a buyer principal? Okay. All right. So you're here looking for opportunities, okay? Um, who has a problem package in the room? Okay. Uh, there we go. All right. So here's a package that you've maybe had for a while. It's a listing you've had. If you're having a hard time marketing, it's got an issue. It's got some hair on it, as we call it. Okay. So here you have 80 associates plus that are going to help troubleshoot and figure out the solution. Okay. Remember that one person's problem is another person's opportunity. Okay. And that's what this room's all about. Okay. Maybe you're working some client haves and want needs, okay? Maybe you have somebody that came to you and said, I've got this property, I wanna get rid of it, okay? We call that a disposition. And I'm looking to relocate, I'm moving to so-and-so, help find a, a solution. We're gonna show you how to do that in one step instead of two, okay? And then of course, many of you came for the education, okay? So I will be wrapping sales techniques, I'll be wrapping discussions about closing deals into this, uh, morning segment here, okay? Okay, so what are the course objectives? Okay, we've got number one, establish a framework of organization, okay? And this is to increase your overall pro productivity at the meeting. You're not gonna understand that as a new person in the first hour of the meeting, but by day three, everything is gonna be a little hazy for you. And the reason is that we'll be 100 presentations into this and it's really important that you incorporate certain principles of organization so that you don't forget everything that occurred in the first two days, okay? We're gonna talk about identifying different tools and strategies that are designed to monetize your participation at these meetings, right? As well as personal and client solutions that stem from your participation, okay? And finally, we're gonna introduce some time management skills to number one, increase your communication ability, and number two, uh, yield more proposals. All right, so communication is key, okay? Now again, I'm, I'm going to share kind of how I did things. Uh, I want you to incorporate your own strategies, but uh, this will be a, a launching board, a starting point for you, okay? So we're gonna break it down into three categories, okay? What we're gonna start discussing is what do we do before a conference, okay? What kind of preparations can you take to be ready to be productive at the meetings and to get deals? This is all about making you money, okay? So if, if there's any doubt, there's a reason, the method behind the madness is we wanna see you get more and more deals, okay? You've got a lot of opportunity in the room. Uh, if I have the opportunity to present my property listing to 80 people versus one, I think I'd take the 80, okay? It's a numbers game, okay? Then we're gonna go into what happens during the conference, okay? You'll see a lot of people during the hours of eight and nine that are eating breakfast and, and you know just visiting with people and that's great. Mm -hmm. I use that time um, to get organized for the meeting, to get with people, uh, set up appointments, uh, to talk about deals, uh, talk about packages that I've pre-reviewed, okay? And then finally, we're gonna wrap it all up with what do you do when it's done? How do you bring it home, okay? All right. So preparation for the conference, it's all about time management, right? So let's start with identifying your priority, okay? If you don't have a priority when you come to these meetings, you're already behind the eight ball because you don't have your direction. You're in a boat without a rudder, right? So pick one to two priority packages when you come down here, okay? Who has the most motivated package? Okay, anybody here with something that is really in trouble that you need help on? Good, okay, I don't see anybody, okay? All right, client counseling. All right, Who's, who in the course, who in the room here rather has taken Ted Blank's or Chuck Sutherland's counseling course? Okay, great. So for those of us that are new, uh, this is a course that you wanna take because it's really preparing your client, if you're working as a broker, to be receptive to what you come back to them with and to create a transaction. Okay. Client counseling. Client counseling. Client counseling. Okay. 
So let's talk a little about that. You know, give me an idea. What do we cover in client counseling? Well, you know, when you sit down with a client, we talk about, you know, identifying the objectives. Why are you selling? Why are you buying? Okay. Um, what are your abilities? Anybody in the room, why is it important that I know the seller's abilities? And I've, I've been coming to these meetings for years and years, and I just found out that there's a guy here that really likes and wants to do horizontal development. So a lot of people in the room here that are presenting land look at that as a real burden, right? There's no income attached, everybody wants income. Well, now I've got a way to work the capital gains side of this, make the profit, okay? So again, it's important that I know what that seller can do, okay? What that seller needs, what are the limitations? And, and some of this comes out in why you're selling, right? What are the limitations of the seller? Maybe he's lost his signature, maybe he has a loan call, okay? So we're gonna get into how that comes into play a little later this morning. But uh, what about geography? How important is it to know that your seller is willing to travel and go out of state versus wanting to stay in, in the market that he's in? Well, I would think it's real important, right? It's kind of hard for you to bring back an opportunity that's in Montana when the client's not willing to leave California, okay? So these are the things that you want to sit down and, and come to a determination on with your client before you come to the meeting, okay? What about uh, motivation, okay? What is, what is your motivation, okay? And, and this comes into play because motivation implies in some cases that maybe there's a clock running, right? Um, maybe this is an equity preservation attempt because a loan's been called or something's happened, okay? Uh, can ads. Anybody in the room not familiar with the term can ad? Okay. So a can ad is you have your primary property, but if we need to build a larger package, maybe there's something that you can add on, okay? Make this a bigger package, okay? And then a little about the client's background, going back to Dan. Okay, now that I know that Dan likes horizontal development, when I have that land listing that I'm bringing down, my 84 acres along the interstate that needs groundwork and excavation and, and you know, horizontal development, now I've got a resource that I can hire to do that for me and I can syndicate that out, okay? So I want you to use NCE as a closing tool Okay, to get listings marketed, okay? Do we have any, anyone in the room that's representing a client that basically told you, I only want to look at stuff in my market? Okay, how do you deal with that? Solution was, is there any collateral in California that they would feel comfortable with in order to be able to take that money outside of California as a potential solution. Okay. Um, and the other way I handled it was just kind of ask if there's any other ideas that may have to get the lender to feel comfortable um, about putting that money outside of their comfort zone. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else have a tool? Go ahead and pass yeah. it back. Doug, what do you do when you have somebody that has a limiting geography? Well, I'd point out that his family already has holdings in other states. And, uh, and I also point out that, that this is a way for him to, you know, where, where do you want to have, you know, he's retired. So where do you want a vacation? Where do you want to spend time? Okay. What are places you always wanted to be? We can structure something, you know, structure development, and you still have a unit in that place. And you can deduct travel and, and everything else. This is all okay. a good deal for you if you have a, a place in Florida and a place in, in Seattle and different places he likes to go. Great. All right, I'm still not hearing the one thing I'm looking for. Yes, ask why. There you go. Ask why, okay? Why is it, why is it that you're limiting yourself to opportunities in Southern California where the average cap rate is four to five percent? Okay, and generally there's an answer to that. And that's that, well, I don't have management. Uh, I don't have familiarity, okay? So those of us that have been in this industry long enough know that we don't necessarily have to have geography. Why is that, okay? Why is it that I don't have to be in Michigan, okay, if I own property in Michigan? 
because I have five members in this organization that own property in that market and I probably acquired that property from somebody in the room, right? Okay, so what does NCE do? What, what, what do these exchange gatherings do for you? Basically what they do is they introduce you to 80 partners in real estate that you have, okay? When I do an exchange with Chuck Sutherland, okay, and I trade him a property in Montana for a property in, let's just say Kansas, if I have a problem, who am I gonna call about that property in Kansas? Probably the guy I got it from, okay? If I need a manager, who am I gonna call for a referral, okay? So again, this gets back to the networking side of things, okay? So, moving on in preparation. Execute your listing, marketing, exchange, consulting agreement, okay? What is, the, what is the cardinal rule here, okay? You don't present unless you have control, right? Anybody in the room, why is it that I need control outside of Board of Realty Ricks, okay? Anybody here work for free? Show of hands, anybody here just for the philanthropy? <laughs> There you go. Involuntarily. Involuntarily, okay. So, so how about we get back to monetizing our, our you know, recouping some uh, revenue for our time, okay? So if you're a broker representing a client and there's another broker representing a client in the room and, and you guys are talking about an exchange, inevitably, is there a compensation that should be discussed? Yes, okay. Is there a cooperating fee? Yes. How do you stand behind that? You have a marketing agreement, you have a consulting agreement, you have a, a power to present, a co-listing, whatever it may be, make sure you have that agreement in place. Does it? NCE have a consulting agreement that they recommend people use because they have one I can access? No, and, and part of the reason for that is legal. Every state has different legal. Uh, for, for those that didn't hear, the question was, does NCE provide a template of a consulting agreement Okay, for those that don't want to do formal listings, okay? So what's the rule? If you're licensed in Montana, can you take a listing in other states? The answer to that is yes. Can you enter that state as a Montana licensee and perform the duties behind your brokerage? The answer is absolutely not. So you need to form a relationship with a broker in that market area. If you and I do a deal, and I need to send my client down to do due diligence. I need somebody that's licensed in that market to do this, okay? So it's important that you have that. Um, answering your question, Doug, okay? In, in other words, where do I go for that? Call me, okay? I can help you put one together, but I'm gonna always recommend to you that you consult your own legal counsel and your own market to make sure the proper disclosures and terminology and language is embedded in that agreement, okay? If you're going to enter the state and do any aspect of marketing, you wonder why these brokers have listings all over the country. And let's talk about commercial real estate. Who knows Dino Bistelarius? Anyone? Okay, so Dino is famous nationwide for doing family dollars, dollar generals, dollar trees, goodwills, and he has product all over the country, okay? But the way that that works for him and the way that he's compensated for that is he basically co-lists those properties with an agent in the state in which, where, where the property is located, okay? So that he can have that person with his feet on the ground facilitate what's needed. You need to have, if you're going to enter the state, you need to have a cooperating broker. And the correct answer is, what governs Board of Realty Reg? Is it national or is it on a state level? Anyone in the room? That's right. And when, have it, when has anyone ever noted that every state has the same exact regulations, okay? So the, the correct answer to your question is you need to follow and, and consult what the regulations are in your state. California, show of hands, who here from California, okay? You guys have more regulations than you can shake a stick at, okay? I am not even gonna begin to provide you counsel on how to navigate that, okay? But CYA, right? Cover yourself, make sure that you have something in writing. Don't enter a state in which you're not licensed to take a client through a property because now as a licensee, you're engaging in a real estate practice in a state to which you don't hold a license. That's a problem, okay? You can have a consulting agreement with your client. If I'm your client, okay, and I own a property in Kansas, 
nothing that says I can't have you represent that property with a consulting agreement and I can pay you a fee, okay, for that service. But let's say you get a deal put together or you have a client uh, that has interest in that property, okay? There may be a need and due diligence to travel to that property and inspect that property and look at you know, the, the tenant there and, and do all that. That's when you wanna make sure that you dial in with one of our members that's licensed in the state in which that property is there and work, work out some kind of a, a fee arrangement. Exactly. You know, don't, don't ignore this. You know, I, I've, I've been doing this for about 10 years and I notice a lot of people just kind of brush that under the rug. Okay? They, don't, they don't have their agreements in place. They're presenting properties on a verbal. Okay, don't do that. Okay, there's never a transaction that's worth a license. Okay, I don't care how much it's worth. Okay, so do, do what you need to do to remain compliant. Okay, now let's shift a little. We're gonna move into how can I stand apart? Okay, come April, you're gonna be in there and there's gonna be 120 people in the room. How many in the room that has been to multiple meetings knows what my brochures look like? Okay. You know when you've received something from me, right? Why is that? Because I always print out and I always bring color brochures on the property. And what do they generally have? They have maps, they have pictures, okay? They, they show you visually what's around the property, they show you the property itself. I want to stand out, okay? Those of you that are active, that are gonna be over the next three days presenting properties or listening to property presentations, making proposals, you're gonna receive what's called a mini offer or a long form offer, okay? So let's, let's stop right here and cover that because it's probably the one area, whether it's NCE or other marketing, equity marketing companies, it's the one area where there is the biggest problem. And that is that you're really quick to throw your hand in the air and say 137-1 is a taker for your 154-3, blah, 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 okay? If you're gonna be a taker, okay, you have in my eyes, okay, this is personal now, you have in my eyes created a fiduciary responsibility to get with that person that you're a taker with. Either present him a mini offer, present him a long form offer, if you're just interested, get with him on the break, pull him outside into the hall, and discuss your ideas, okay? These are non-binding proposals. So again, for those of you that are new, when you come into the marketing meeting room tomorrow, you're gonna see a bunch of these. These are mini form offers, non-binding proposals. You're gonna see this, this is a long form offer. And you're gonna hear terminology that I'm gonna explain in more detail tomorrow morning. But really quickly, you'll hear the word interested, you'll hear the word taker, you'll hear the word super taker, okay? Mr. Sutherland, what is a super taker? I signed a contract today and closed based on my own decision. I have power to make a decision, whether it's my own inventory or someone else's, right? Okay, anyone in the room, what's a taker? Okay. A taker is somebody that, number one, has, has decision-making authority to a degree, but they see a transaction here, okay? They, they see a deal, they're hearing what they want to hear, they're here to satisfy certain objectives either on behalf of their client or on their own portfolio, okay? And because of that, they're at a level where if they hear the right stuff during the presentation and then they answer at the end of the presentation with the word taker, that means you and I need to get together because what we're really wanting to discuss here is how to formulate a transaction. Now the difference between a taker and a super taker is a super taker has heard everything he needs to hear. He's ready to go to contract, okay? Now what's the least level of interest? Interested, okay? What does this mean? What does interested mean? We're all interested, right? Interested means I'm hearing some stuff here, I got a number of questions, there may be a transaction, okay? But we need to visit, so let's get together, okay? Anyone in the room, what is the most important reason to use these? Anyone have an idea? Keep track, Keep track. that's great. What else, follow up, right? Anyone in this room not get a phone call from me personally before this meeting? 
Anyone in this room not get at least two or three phone calls if you didn't register till uh, the end, right before the meeting? How many people are sick of hearing from me? Okay. Well, I'm sick of email. Okay. So, if you think you're good at follow up, raise your hand and I'll let you know if you're right. Okay. So, what's the most important thing? How do you get deals? How did I put together the 65 transactions that I closed? that took me from north of 20 million in personally guaranteed debt back to zero, okay, or I had, okay, I did that by follow-up. I did that by being very aggressive and targeting certain objectives at each meeting, making offers, getting deals put together, okay, and closing on those deals. The only way that occurs is when you communicate. So don't forget that when you're a taker for a property, don't stop there. You're only about 10% of the way. You can jump to about half of the way when you get to a written proposal. So write those minis, and if you hear people call out your name, okay, go to that person and ask them. Write down those numbers when you're presenting. The best time to get things resolved and get things figured out is while you're here at the meeting, okay? So back to, back to our uh, slideshow here. So we got brochure preparation. I like to create something that I hand to one of you in the room when I make a proposal so that you have a little background on my package. Okay? How many in the room brought backup? Okay. Now, what's generally in a backup package? Okay. Backup package may contain an APOD if it's a commercial income producing property, right? Uh, it may contain Pictures of the property, general summary, copy of leases, operating expenses, right? Uh, copy your tax bill, copy your insurance bill. Something so that if you have a super taker in that room that's ready to rock and roll and he asks for backup, you have it there. Now, I'm sure that there's a number of you in the room here that are going, oh my God, I didn't do anything to prepare for this marketing meeting. What am I gonna do? Show of hands, anyone? Okay, all right, so what do you do? Well, not a problem. Okay, we, we can do this on the fly. Anybody know how to use email? Okay, so you can drop a PDF. You can email everyone that's a taker your backup. Okay, so don't hesitate to do that. Um, when I submit an offer and I start my follow up towards the end of this morning, I'm going to show you what I do when I get home and how I incorporate that backup. Okay, so now we'll move to the other thing that we, we tend to see lacking. Um, Carrie's gonna be handing out a bunch of packages that were late to the book. Some of the reason behind those being late to the book was because you didn't register till the last minute. And some of the reason is because you forgot to upload them or you didn't realize they'd fallen off the system because they'd expired out, okay? So why is it important prior to the cutoff when we send this book down to be printed and prepared for you for our marketing meeting? Why is it important to load your package in the book? Anyone? Chuck? Did everybody get to see it? There you go. Would you, would you take a listing in your local market and not upload that on the MLS? Okay. If you use an MLS system? No. You want the maximum visibility. You want that in the book. But there's more to it than that. Okay, you're gonna see production Okay, up in the front of the room, vigorously writing down numbers. And after the meeting, they're going to give you, via email, something called a trader board, okay? It's basically a summary of every presentation by number, okay? And it's gonna be followed by all the takers, okay? So it's important to have it in the book for that reason as well. Because what if you get a proposal from somebody where they say, I'm a taker, okay? What do you have there? You have a taker. Now, most of us will look at that proposal and we'll say, that doesn't fit my objectives. I'm looking for a commercial income. You're offering me a residential condo, okay? Why is it important that I don't throw that away? How about this scenario? How about if uh, there's another person out there that presented exactly what I'm looking for and they're looking for a residential condo? What do I have there? I have a three-way transaction, don't I? That trader board helps assemble that, okay? You can go through the book because you know what your client or you know what you need and you can look for what you need. And if somebody presents something to them that you 
that you want. You can now incorporate, no matter what offers you got, a transaction between three parties. Okay, we have a, we have a social event on day two called the Cowboy Auction. Anybody not familiar with the Cowboy Auction? Okay, so the Cowboy Auction is designed to teach you, utilizing personal property, all about how to build multiple leg transactions, okay? So make sure that you don't miss that event because it's a lot of fun, okay? All right, so when I come to the meeting, okay, I get set up tomorrow morning. You're gonna see me, I'm usually towards the back of the room on the left side, and I basically set up my office. I've got brochures in a line of everything that I've got, even stuff that's not in the book. Why is that? Because I may see something that I want, and I may want to create a transaction involving multiple properties. I may see something uh, that I want more than something I already have that I never put in the book. So I want that brochure there to present with an offer. Okay? All right. So knowing that, we're going to shift now to some initial review and pre-departure action items that I incorporate, okay? So we haven't gotten on the plane yet, we haven't hopped in our car to drive down here, okay? So what's the first thing that we do? Uh, you're gonna get a few days before you head out for the meeting, a PDF of the marketing book. Everyone get that? Okay, those that didn't probably registered right at the end, okay? So, opinions vary, and I want you to incorporate what's best for you. I wanna caution you before I go any further. Looking at the marketing book and looking at each package is not going to tell you everything about that package, okay? Our tendency is to predetermine judgment on a package if we haven't heard the presentation and heard the parameters of what makes that property something we should own. So this is a general guideline, but I still look at the book, okay? <coughs> Production forward. <coughs> How many here loaded a package in the book for this marketing meeting that doesn't have any pictures or they don't have a brochure or backup, okay? Reminder, you have Thomas Powell, okay? And you'll wanna write this email address down. It's Thomas, and like November, Powell at Comcast.net. Thomas and Teresa are our production managers, okay? If you send them a JPEG or a, or a GIF or a PDF or anything that has a picture, that puts us on the street, in that building, around that building, around that package that you're marketing, around that land that you're marketing, it's gonna get projected on the big screen during your presentation. Picture speaks a thousand words, I love pictures. Pictures sell, okay? Personal property selection. You know, our personal property exchange has become really popular. I've acquired real estate as a buyer at personal property exchanges, okay? So don't discount that aspect of the networking, okay? We'll have different, different level of boards that get created. If any of you have questions on how to go through the process of, and, and be productive during a cowboy auction, come see me after this. Um, foundation, how many are aware we have a 501c3 nonprofit foundation, okay? Not very many of you. Okay, so we established this a few years ago. Um, we accept donations in the foundation. We utilize that money to further education, both on an NCE level as well as on a local affiliate group level. How many in this room are a member of one of our local affiliate groups around the country? Okay, many of you, okay? So we have 17 different organizations, 16 are active right now, and we have three more that are in the discussion stages. And these are local exchange groups, local gatherings that occur. And they do basically a downscale version of what you're gonna see on the national stage here at the uh, conference, okay? This is where you learn the principles and you learn the different techniques of going through and doing equity marketing exchanges. Can anybody tell me in the room one benefit they've taken away? And this is really directed more towards people that have been doing this for years, okay? What is one benefit you've taken away from what you do here at Creative Marketing versus what you do in general brokerage? Anyone? Yeah. Relationships. Relationships, okay. Expand on that. Why is it important to form these relationships? 
you have a resource in 35 to 40 different states that you can call on if you're considering an investment. Mark, is that beneficial in your business? Very beneficial, isn't it? Okay. All right. Right. There's a reason, guys, that we have social events here. Okay. It's not just because we all want to party. Okay. It's it's to give you an opportunity to get to know the people that you're going to be doing business with for the next 20 years, hopefully, or longer. Okay. It helps you sit down in a more informal manner and explore everybody's talent. Okay. Who in this room knows Colby Salmon at least by name? Okay. If we're doing a storage unit park. And you're going to have a class this afternoon on storage units. Who do you consider to be the godfather of all that's in storage units? It's Colby, right? It's how he built his business. You want to talk to somebody that's been in, in real estate for a couple of years and just has a well-rounded knowledge of residential and commercial if you're buying a storage unit park? Or do you want to talk to somebody that's been doing it for 40 years and made every single mistake that can be made? Okay? And, and is willing to share that with you, right? Okay? So you know, incorporate these relationships into your practice because they're, they're, they're valuable, they're huge, okay? So we talked about why it's important to upload your offerings in the book, okay? Bring in brochures and backups, stand out, give a summary of what they've got because when I get back from this conference, I'm gonna have a binder full of offerings and properties and when I have a backup brochure, I can look at that, I can determine is this something that I wanna pursue, okay? So you really want to, you know, make sure that you give that property presentation the credibility it deserves. Put together a flyer, put together something you can give. Why is the initial book review an important exercise? So getting back to the book review. For those that haven't seen our marketing books, this is a marketing book right here. Okay, we start out with agendas, roster of the meeting, okay? Why is it important that I review the roster of the meeting? I wanna know who's there, I wanna know who I know, who I don't know. I'm gonna flip through the book, I may find something that I actually wanna get started on before the meeting. Great story here. Anybody know Arvid? Okay, so we're, we're gonna rewind about four years. I'm going through a marketing book before a marketing meeting, and I'm paging through and I'm looking at the different offerings and I see something that Arvid has, and I said, okay, this is perfect. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to match up the value of a certain equity with the property value that I have that has debt on it that I want to get rid of. So what we call that is going down and out, right? I'm trying to get rid of this bank loan that is a noose around my neck and I want to salvage equity, okay? So I call Arvid on the phone. This is before we came down to the meeting and I said, hey, Arvid, send me your backup on this property. So he does, he's got backup and I send him mine and we get on the phone and we talk about it. One thing leads to another. And all of a sudden we're out of excuses. It works for him and it works for us, okay? So what do I do? I type up a buy sell. I, I, I put together a sales contract, hop on the plane and I fly down, okay? About 20 minutes before the first night social on Monday, I said, Arvin, meet me in the lobby right outside the social about 20 minutes before. We signed the contract, I called the title company and uh, opened escrow. And then I walked into the first night social. So is there a benefit to going through and starting to establish those relationships and make appointments? Mark, you do a good job of this. You sent out some packages with an email recently. And you said, here's some packages I'm marketing. If any of you have some interest in this and you need some information, get with me, I'll send you my backup, okay? Uh, please consider these, uh, you know, at the marketing meeting. Nothing wrong with establishing contact, okay? But you can actually put deals together. Now, what's the biggest benefit outside of doing the deal, right? Outside of me resolving my objective. What's one of the advantages that because I was organized and I planned ahead, that I was able to receive in getting that deal put together? I just beat all of you to the punch. He doesn't even have to present the property. Okay, because I'm already under contract, so I got first position on this, don't I? Okay, all right. So review the book. Look at the uh, look at the daily agenda. If you have a package that is a value add opportunity package, see if one of the segments 
is value add projects so that you can know when you want to present that package. Okay? If you have a complicated package, in other words, this is a really hard thing to present in a typical five minute podium presentation. How many of you have a project that's probably a little bit difficult to present in five minutes? Anyone? Okay. So we have a tool for that, okay? Outside of pre-moderation to try to cond condense it down. We have a tool for that and that's the round tables in the morning. Any problem with holding a round table and saying I've got a great opportunity, this is at the podium, right? I have a great opportunity I think this, this really needs to be a round table. There's a lot of complexity to this, but I'm trying to syndicate this, or I'm trying to do this, or I'm trying to do that. Uh, I'm gonna hold a round table at eight o'clock tomorrow. Anybody that might have interest in this, you know, here's the bullets of why you may have interest, please come attend. And then you can take the time and you know, present that opportunity in a less formal state when the clock isn't ticking, right? Okay, so. Trial close. Who does not understand the principle of a trial close? Okay. So this goes back to my days uh, back in the 80s when I cut my teeth in sales going door to door. I'll, I'll go further back to the 70s, selling vegetables out of my mom's vegetable garden door to door in my neighborhood. And when I grew up and I got out of the military, I sold encyclopedias, children's books, photo plans. You want to learn how to deal with objection? Come spend a day doing that, okay? So, trial close, you know, we're gonna put our sales hat on now, is am I getting the job done for you, okay? So part of client counseling, okay? Learning those objectives is what you're really doing is you're gathering information, okay? That you need to best place that client in the property that meets the highest amount of those objectives, right? Their, 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 their goal is probably to get rid of a property they don't want, okay? Your goal is to find them something that's better, okay? Sometimes that takes more than two steps, or one step rather, okay? Sometimes you got a piece of land and you wanna to go to cash. Well, guess what, guys? We, we specialize in exchanging properties. I'm not gonna say that cash transactions don't occur. One occurred at the October meeting for me personally. I had a client in October, he came in and says, I like this property, I'd like to buy it. Do you take cash? I said, let me think about that. Okay, so we went under contract and he closed right, right before the turn of the year, okay? So that will occur. Does that occur very often? It hasn't for me, okay? So what you may want to consider is, if, if you want to go to cash, if that's your ultimate object, objective, and you got a piece of raw land that has a need on it, right? Whether it be a mortgage or whether it just be the carrying cost of taxes and, and uh, HOA dues or whatever, maybe you take a step sideways into something that gets you to cash quicker, okay? This is what a three-way is about. This is what a multi-step exchange is about, okay? So I had a, a lot in the subdivision and we call this uh, to a degree currency land, even though it was a subdivision lot. 60 miles east of Jesus, middle of nowhere out there in the boonies, right? You don't come to the marketing meeting, I'm looking for this out in the middle of nowhere, you know, because I want to build a bomb shelter, okay? Now, if there's anybody in the room, come see me, I've got some property to sell you. But for those of you that may have that, and your ultimate objective is cash, maybe what you want to start with is moving out of that equity into something, putting a loan against that something, and forcing that consideration so you can tap into that equity and go into something that has an income generator. Now that didn't fit your objective, right? You wanted to go to cash and all of a sudden I'm telling you to spend more money. Okay. Why am I doing that? Because I'll bet a larger percentage of the room is willing to look at that income producing asset that is looking to go to cash or is doing a 1031 exchange, okay? So very important, uh, when you get along the way in, in in a transaction, in a presentation, you're sitting down with your client. The reason I use a trial close is to see how I'm doing, okay? Does this meet your objectives? And if it doesn't, tell me why, okay? Now, I will often do this even when I'm in a client counseling relationship. And the reason I do this is because it tells me what I'm missing. 
It may tell me what I'm forgetting. It may clarify better for me certain objectives of the client that he wasn't really good about telling me. How many of you sat down with a client? This, this goes back a few meetings ago. And he sat down and he said, this is what we do. I'm gonna be bringing you offers on X, Y, and Z. Okay, and you come down to the meeting and all of a sudden lightning strikes and you find the perfect three different opportunities and you bring them home and you sit down with your client. And he looks at you with this blank stare and says, I really just want to go to cash. Anybody have that happen? I don't like this stuff. Okay, so I like to, I like to use the trial close every once in a while just to say, hey, I've got this property. You know, I was just on the phone. I was doing some pre-marketing before I came down to the meeting. I think this meets some of the objectives that we talked about in my office. I'm gonna send you a PDF on this. Give me your thoughts on this. So then he calls me on the phone and he says, well, this doesn't work for me because of X, Y, and Z, okay? Now this X, Y, and Z may be stuff that he never shared with me. Anybody know why that's important information for me to have? Because I don't have to duplicate it when I come down here. I don't have to spin my wheels looking at proposals that don't meet the objectives of the client, okay? It allowed him to further clarify what I need to be focused on in that meeting, okay? All right. Now we've done all our preparation. We've talked to a few people. We figured out, okay, these are the packages that I want. I've got a little list. I'm, I'm a big fan of a yellow pad, okay? I love yellow pads. And I've got a list of about 14 different packages in this book. And I've already written eight mini offers that I brought to the meeting that I'm gonna be handing out before we even start marketing, okay? And I know who I need to get with initially. Now there is going to be two dozen people that are presenting packages that when I looked at it and I glanced through the book, didn't make sense to me. But there's gonna be something that comes out in that presentation that's a hot button for me. And I'm gonna want that package, okay? But these first eight and, and these first you know 12 people I wanna to talk to, these first eight mini offers and first dozen people I wanna to talk to, I already know who they are. So I'm gonna be going up to those people even before we start in the marketing. I'm gonna ask them a few questions. I'm gonna ask them to email me some backup. I'm gonna take a look at that because I wanna be prepared to enter into a transaction, okay? October meeting, the last meeting that we had, I came away with three transactions. One is closed, two are in escrow, okay? One of those two is closing very shortly, okay? The other one, we're working through some uh, issues that came up during escrow, okay? So, when I get down here, I'm going to be checking in with all the uh, attendees that are representing packages that I like, and I'm going to be setting an appointment, okay? When's the best time to meet them? When's the best time when you're looking at a book and you see something you like to get with that client? Anyone? How about before all the distractions? How about before we're running around the room competing with 80 other people? that love this package, okay? Take advantage of the socials, guys. You know, if, if you take away one or two tidbits out of this and it gives you just a little bit of an edge, that may be all, all you need to get the deal, okay? When you're presenting, keep it simple. Everyone familiar with the term KISS? Keep it simple, stupid, okay? So don't go into this extended dialogue on how beautiful the beach is, okay, and how the waves come in every 12 seconds, and how the shopping's great because they got this brand new store that has these beautiful handbags, okay. When we're talking about a commercial property, hit the nuts and bolts. When you're one-on-one, -on -one, get into painting the picture, okay. When you're at the podium, listen to your moderators. Anybody here not know what a moderator is? Our moderators are our guides. Okay, they're taking us on this adventure of this property presentation. There are certain questions that moderators ask. Okay, follow your moderator's lead. If you have a complicated package, ask for a pre-moderation. Maybe there's some stuff that you want to get out to your moderator. Okay, so go to your meeting manager and ask him for a uh, pre-moderation because we can help steer that presentation to help everyone understand this certain point about this property that's gonna to lead to more proposals. Our job as moderators is to find you takers in the room, okay? Those takers will not always have proposals that work for you. That's, we're not concerned about that. 
I'm concerned about getting takers. When the moderators get through asking the questions and it's time to take numbers at the end of the presentation, the worst thing that you can do is try to keep presenting your package, okay? You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna obstruct the flow of what that moderator's trying to do, which is get you takers, okay? Now, I've noticed something over the last two years, okay? We've turned over our organization, we've grown a tremendous amount. Four years ago, we put 73 new members in one year on, okay? We're now in more of a maintenance mode where we're putting on 50 to 60 new members at least. Okay? We have 14 new members as of this meeting just in this year alone. Okay? What does that mean? You've got new brokers, you've got new properties, you've got new areas of focus, you have new expertise. Okay? So it's real important to follow a certain process because if we're moderating your package, okay, you have to answer the questions that we're asking because we know what we're trying to drive towards. Okay, presenting from the eyes of a taker, okay? Again, when I stand at the podium, what I'm thinking as the moderator's asking me questions and I'm answering them is, in my answer, if I'm somebody in the room that doesn't have the familiarity with my property, are they gonna understand what I'm saying? Okay, so I wanna make sure that I present the, the, the best points about this property that's gonna get the most interest, okay? So, overview, okay? Real quick, be prepared when you get up to the podium to talk a little about the property. And you actually have a guide here. So let's just take a package out of the book here, okay? All right. What did I turn to? Is Ben Kogan in the room? No? Okay. So Ben's got a package, Burlington Commons, out of, out of uh, Iowa, it looks like. And it's got about a million five in actual income. It's priced at $11 million, okay? So when he gets up to the podium, most moderators are probably gonna say, okay, start with a brief description of the property. Tell me a little about the property. Okay, now keep in mind, you've got a total of five minutes and I've got about six or seven categories that I wanna get through, okay? So, brief description of the property. What do you have, okay? Then we're gonna get into motivation. We're gonna get into ownership, okay? And then there's gonna be a few question answer kind of things. Uh, you, you know, there may be a, a question or verification. Is that actual income, is it projected? You're gonna talk a little about maybe some can-ads. Can you add this package? There may be a couple questions, and then we're gonna get down to it, and we're gonna take takers. Follow that sequence, okay? Question comes up. George Knorr in the room? George, good morning. George is really good at this. You don't see this guy present much, but he does business, okay? So do I kick or do I receive? In other words, do I get up and moderate, have a moderator moderate my package and present that to the group? Or do I sit there and listen to the presentations and when I see something that fits my bill, take the initiative to be the first one to the punch and you get to, you get to write the offer? Why is it beneficial to be the one that creates that initial proposal? You get to create that offer, the structure of that offer, the way you want it. Okay, you get to cherry pick the inventory that you like the most from the presentations that you're listening to and you get to be the initiating party. If you receive an offer from me, it's gonna be written from the eyes of me as a seller and it's gonna be structured in the way that I wanna do the transaction. So, why do I bring this up? In this meeting where we have 80 some people in the room, okay, we're gonna have plenty of time to get through all the presentations, multiple times, we're gonna have quick pitches, we're gonna have different uh, segments that are themed, you know, whether it be development land, most motivated, highest priority package, um, value add projects, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But what happens when there's 130 people in the room? Okay, everybody's struggling to get that microphone, right? They wanna pitch their package, okay? Don't be afraid to sit in that seat, listen to everybody else's package and be the initiating party. You may find that it works really well because 
they're not just sitting there watching, they're sitting there doing business. They're pulling out those proposals, they're writing minis, they're taking notes, and they're cherry picking what they want to do. Everyone understand that? So don't, don't worry about always having to be in front of that mic. Okay. All right, writing down your takers. Why is it important when I'm at the podium to have a pen and a piece of paper at the end when Chuck's getting numbers for me? I want to talk to people that are takers while I'm here at the meeting. I want to exchange my backup. I want to assert certain points about my property that I want to exchange. Okay. While you guys are following up at home, I'm already in position with a contract, right? So I write down the numbers because when the breaks come, I want to go over if I haven't received a mini offer, okay, or a long form proposal, and I want to say, hey, what is your idea? Why did you call your number out for my presentation? Well, I was thinking I got this, this, and this, and I think if we do this and, and you do that, we can do this together. I said, great, give me your backup. If I wouldn't ask that question at the meeting, what are the chances that he's gonna remember that idea he had when he's listened to 42 presentations that day? Show of hands. You gonna remember that? I can't remember my middle name, okay? So part of the reason for soliciting these proposals is because I've only got 12 brain cells left, okay? So I need help, okay? I need something to remind me. I love books because I get to write notes and I get to put explanation marks and stars and asterisks, underline, okay? I, I wanna remind myself what triggered that, okay? I wanna circle certain things on the page which gives me an idea. I wanna write down on that page the property that I think is gonna be ideal for that, okay? And then I'm gonna take all those proposals when I get back and the last part of our, our little talk this morning is gonna address how to take all that and turn it into money. Okay. So, very important to write down your takers. Very important. Okay. Okay, so follow up. Follow up, follow up, follow up. When is the best time to follow up? Okay, when does it start? When does your follow up start? Okay, starts at the meeting, right? If you wait till you're back home and you're, you're doing your first follow up back home, you're probably going to forget some stuff. You're probably going to forget certain presentations that work really well. Again, this format is what works for me. It's not all going to work for you guys. Okay? Mm. There's certain people that have certain areas that they focus on at these marketing meetings. Okay? Take what you can out of this, throw the rest away. Okay? But I can tell you that by day three, I'm willing to bet some pretty good money that some of you in this room are gonna forget a lot of what happened on day one, okay? Because it is overwhelming, okay? So I like to do it in the breakouts. I like to use those breakout rooms. That's where we hold our round tables. So when you're in the marketing meeting at the front of the room on the right-hand side, it's Florentine B. You walk into that room, there's about six or seven big round tables with a bunch of chairs, okay? If you're not there for the morning round tables on Wednesday and Thursday morning, be aware that that room is open to you starting tomorrow morning, 24 seven, to sit down with people, talk about your uh, ideas, put together deals. It's a place where you can meet or you can meet out in the hallway or what have you, find a couple chairs, okay? Work the breaks. Those breaks, outside of running to the restroom, those breaks are ideal to walk around and get those people that were takers, which is why I write the numbers down during the presentation so I can go to them and say, hey, can I get a mini on that? What package are you thinking of? And I want to look at that, okay? I'm okay getting to a no. A no is a wonderful thing. What's a no? A no means I get, to, I get to stop focusing on that and move on to a yes. A no is one step closer to a yes. I'm a big believer in numbers. It's all numbers, okay? It may take 10 no's to get to a yes, but if I know that and I get three no's in 45 minutes, I know where, I know where that deal's heading, okay? I'm gonna to get to that yes, okay? Grade your proposals, okay? Now, let's separate for this topic whether we're talking about a client brokerage relationship or whether we're talking about acting as a principal on your own account with your own property, okay? I like to grade the proposals. If, if I sat down with a client and the client says, I've got this commercial property, I'm moving, I don't wanna deal with this property anymore, I'd like to go down and out, okay? What does that mean? Anyone? Down and out. What's that mean? Cash out. 
I want some cash, I'll take some property consideration, but I'm heading down the value ladder. What's up and away? I'm adding debt, I'm adding cash, I'm adding, I'm going up the ladder of value. Okay. For those of you that are fairly new, there is a glossary in the back of this binder. It has four pages of terminology. You may not know what a Missouri Waltz is. You will at the end of this marketing meeting if you glance through the glossary, okay? So I like to grade the proposals. If I see a proposal and I gave a presentation, I said I'm heading down and out, and I get this proposal, and it's a million dollar property, and Joe Smith comes up to me and says, hey, I've got this great $10 million property, and I'll take that million dollar property as partial consideration, okay? That may not have as, as strong, in my eyes, a potential for my client as if somebody comes up and says, I've got this $300,000 condo. It happens to be where you mentioned that your client's moving. And I'm actually looking for passive commercial income producing property. I don't like managing residential, okay? I think that's gonna be up there on the list, don't you? Okay, so grade those proposals, okay? Tag their number, watch their presentations for third leg. So when I go through the book, and I, I told you I wrote down a list of numbers, okay? Part of the reason I write that down is I'm really watching, okay? I'm really watching for that presentation because I want to find out a little bit more on that property. It's already attracted my attention, okay? All right. Work in the socials, okay? What a great, great place to sit down. You're eating. You can kind of get to know each other, find out what the background is, okay? So use those socials to, uh, to network, okay? What if the proposal doesn't work, okay? So you have a response form. You got a uh, long form with three copies on it. You get a proposal. It should have two copies, and I'm gonna keep the bottom one. And let's say that proposal is written and doesn't work, okay? I receive a proposal from George. George has a Las Vegas condominium. He knows that I like this area. I'm looking for something like that. But there's something with his proposal that doesn't work. There's an area on that proposal where I can write a counter. Write your counters. Tell, tell George how it will work, okay? So when you get a note from somebody, ask why. Say, okay, I'm a taker for your property. How would this property that I'm offering you work for you? What can I do to get you more interested in this property, okay? We're so quick to just toss it away, okay? How many of you go through your properties and everywhere where there's an offer that doesn't work, you just kind of throw those in the trash can right behind your desk? Anyone? Don't do that. If you get a proposal from me and it doesn't work, what are you gonna do? You're gonna look at all the other takers of, of that property presentation that I gave. And you're gonna go to those takers' properties, you're gonna say, okay, is there something there that works? And now you've got a three-way presentation. It took, me, it took me a good two years before I realized that I was doing this wrong, okay? Uh, there's a cash and paper session, okay? There's usually a disparity, is there not? You're looking for cash, he's looking to uh, get a little cash, there's some cash missing there. Sometimes you can use that cash and paper board of people that have money that they wanna bring in. You can help use that, you can use that cash help shore up your transaction proposal, okay? Now, that in sort is kind of a three-way as well, is it not? Okay. So, if you get a proposal you don't like, write a counteroffer. Tell them how it will work for you, okay? No go, why save, okay? Well, I think we already answered that. You save it because there may be a way to put together a multi-leg multi transaction, okay? And like Chuck said, it may not work now, but things may change and it may work later. My best partner relationship is a gentleman that I found, how many of you remember REE.com, realestateexchange.com? Anybody use that? Okay. So I, I found this property this guy had on REE.com, and this is gonna, oh boy, this is gonna age me. This goes back to, 2007, 2006. So we get on the phone and we actually have a really nice conversation for an hour. Here's the problem, it didn't work, okay? The transaction that I had, I had this debt. He didn't want that debt. We couldn't make the equities worth, but he left an impression on me. 
So it didn't work, but I saved his contact, okay? So lo and behold, a few years later, I'm going through and I'm cleaning up my contacts and I run across this guy and I'm you know, like, oh, geez, I remember him. Call him on the phone, we get to visit him again. All of a sudden, things have changed, right? My debt position's changed, I'm starting to get some recovery, I'm starting to figure out a way to make this deal work. So we get back into the topic of the discussion. And along the way, we spend about two months back and forth talking about what his objectives are. Okay, talk about client counseling, oh my God. Okay, so it's been two years since my initial phone call. And we're talking about he, he wants to build his estate up, he wants to move a lot of his equity into a self-directed IRA uh, and kind of set himself up for retirement. So we develop a strategy together in client counseling on how we're gonna do this. We're gonna take multiple properties, we're gonna assign a value here, we're gonna assign a different value here. It's all gonna work out in the end. We're gonna shift this transaction so that you can own this in your Roth with little cash that you have, okay? It's gonna shelter your income, you can take distributions because it's a Roth self-directed and you don't have any tax issues. So that was really important to him. What was important to me? What was important to me was getting his cash so I could solve that problem with the bank and I could retain some of my equity, okay? So we had the makings now of a mutual benefit-driven transaction, which is really what we strive to do here, okay? Why is it important when you're dealing with people in this room, in this organization, in the National Council of Exchangers, why is it important that that transaction be a win-win? Anyone? because you want repeat business, right? Because you don't want to just do one deal. The first deal is the icebreaker. I want the six deals that are after that, okay? So we are looking for the group within the group that have that opportunity for us for multiple transactions. Nothing wrong with doing a transaction, okay? Nothing wrong with a single hit. Solves a problem, okay? But I like the multiple deals that can occur, okay? All right, round tables. Okay, holding a round table. I mentioned that there may be a property presentation that you have that's more complex. It may be a syndication offering. You don't want to offer a partnership LLC subscription offering in the room. Okay, why is that? Anyone? Security. Securities exchange law, right? Okay, but you can sit in a round table and you can do a formal subscription offering. Or you could be very general and say, I've got this property, I'm going to be syndicating it. Please see me if you have an interest on a one-on-one, -on -one. okay? So let's, let's be mindful of Security Exchange Commission laws, okay? And regulations that say I can only subscribe 30 people or I can only present this to 30 people. And then there's state laws that unfortunately are in conflict with federal laws. So you wanna be familiar with that too and default to the to the smallest number, right? So, but there are certain circumstances where a round table is really beneficial. If I've got a development project, Dan Arnold, okay, and it's 4,800 acres, and it needs X, Y, and Z, and it's owned uh, by a nonprofit, and you know, it needs this, that, and the other, and I'm trying to syndicate it, that may be a little bit more than I can handle in a uh, two minute quick pitch or a five minute presentation, right? So that may be a perfect candidate for a, uh, a round table presentation, okay? So why should you attend, okay? Why you should attend is very similar to why you should get with people on breaks, why you should go to socials, why you should get to know the people that you're doing business with four times a year here or more, okay? You should attend because it's a great way to get to know people, get to know their background, get to know their strengths, their talents, their focus. I may buy a property, okay, this just happened, this just happened from the October meeting just prior. I have a property in my market and I needed a partner in that property and because I knew that person and his talent, his abilities, I knew that I could go to him and put together a partnership, okay? All right, so we did that. And we went under construction and we're nearing completion on, on developing that. And because I knew his background and he knew to go to him, we're each gonna share very healthy profit on this project, okay? So get to know the people in the room. I'm terrible with this. I need to know each and every one of you and what you focus on, 
but not just your area of expertise. What are your objectives? What are your goals? What do you, where do you want to be in this organization two years from now? I was talking to a gentleman last night and he says, I really want to monetize my relationship to this organization better. I want to get in front of the right people. Okay. The only way you do that is get to know them. Okay. And let people know what you're trying to, what you're trying to do. Okay. So back to the uh, production cycle, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. is my prime time. Okay. Why is it prime time? Okay. This is when I'm checking my minis. I'm checking my takers to see if I've got all my mini offers or my long form proposals. I'm checking to make sure that I had met with everybody that I had set forth to meet with. I'm looking at the presentations from the prior day. I'm seeing if there's something else that I may be able to, to get involved in. I'm going through the book. I'm double checking. If I haven't gotten to a certain task, be it write a mini offer because I gave my number on something, that's what I do. I can do that in the room as well. Back in my early days when I had a whole gob of problems, okay, I was working into the night. They're out there socializing, drinking around the fireplace, having a good old time. I'm in my room pulling out my 10B or my 12C, punching the numbers and figuring out, does this transaction work? Does this resolve the issue that I have? You can give this as little or as much as your tolerance will allow. Okay, the more you give it, the more it will give to you. Okay. So do your homework. You're only here for three days, guys, not counting education. You're here Tuesday, Wednesday, and you're heading home Thursday, or you're staying over and heading home Friday, okay? Make the most of it. You've got three months to bring it all together after the meeting, okay? Plus or minus a week, okay? So make use of your time, okay? Check the presentation schedule. Am I gonna be up? Am I moderating today? Am I going to present today? Am I on the list? Okay. Attend those round tables. Okay. Country store. Who knows what the country store is in our marketing room? Who doesn't? All right. So that's, that's been in our marketing room as long as I've been a member. Okay. There's a table when you walk into the conference room. And, and for those of you that have been to a conference before, you know we have a divider wall that separates the sponsors and the food from the actual marketing room, from the trading deck as we call it, okay? As you walk in on the left side, there's a table there. By the end of the meeting, you're gonna see a bunch of brochures all over that table. Okay, what are these? These are brochures on properties, okay? Whether they're in the book or not in the book, maybe you got a listing on your way down here. Can't present it. Uh, you know, you, you've got limited time to do that, but you want to get that out to the audience. That's what that country store is for. So if you've got some inventory that's not in the book or that you don't have time to present, get it out there because I'm going to be perusing that table. I'm going to be looking at what's available there and I may take it home and call you because I may see an idea here. Okay, so that's what that table's for. Okay, and guys, most of all, remember, feed, eat, okay? This is a marathon, this isn't a sprint. You, you basically have 72 hours of nonstop presentations of properties going on, okay? You've got an entire audience of people with their checkbook ready to buy your property. What an opportunity, okay? Make sure that you give yourself the nutrition, feed the fire. I've seen people pass out, okay? Huh? Hydrate. Hydrate, that's right. <laughs> Stupid as that sounds. So what we talked about this morning so far is we talked about different methods to prepare for a marketing meeting. We talked about certain tools that we use while we're here, how to, how to navigate through the production phase. And what we're gonna focus on for the last hour is how to bring it all home and turn it into money. Money, 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 okay? So first of all, I should have brought this up at the beginning of the presentation. My apologies for that. There are no stupid questions. <laughs> if any of you have a question and you're afraid to ask it, don't, okay? Uh, every one of us in this room, we're here for our first time at some point. It's a little different format than what we're used to in cash brokerage, okay? We're dealing with kind of cutting out the, uh, the secondary <laughs> step. Chances are good that if your client or you are selling a property, you're probably doing so for you know, a number of different possible reasons, but the primary ones being 
You want out of what you have and you want to go into something either better in your eyes, better can be defined by your own book of talents, own book of desires, own desires geographically, okay? Or you're trying to reposition it for a client uh, and there's, there's, there's a million reasons why people sell, okay? And there's just as many reasons why people buy. Rarely do we see somebody that is in the business of owning property stop owning property, okay? What we're talking about doing here is cutting out one step, okay? You go through a cash brokerage, you list a property, it goes on MLS, it gets shown, an offer gets sent, you review it, you may counter, you may accept, ultimately you come to terms, you go to escrow, you get a title policy, go to a closing table, if all the contingencies are satisfied and you close the deal. Then you get a bucket of money. Chances are probably pretty good you're paying some capital gains on that. Okay. What we're talking about doing is reinvesting the property at the same time that you're selling the property. So we're talking about an exchange. Who in this room can tell me one of the benefits of doing this all in one step versus doing it in two separate steps? Let's turn on our creative financial brains here. You don't have a clock? Don't have a clock, okay. So, no escrow fee, that's good. No title fees, no escrow fees. Sometimes there's fees though, isn't there? Okay, if I trade a condo for a building with you, we may want to see a preliminary title policy. We may want to make sure everything is peachy king. There may be uh, some legal prep, warranty deed transfer documents, what have you, okay? But how about this? How about the ability for us to 1031 exchange and defer capital gains tax? Not that we can't do that through a uh, intermediary in, in general brokerage, but when we already have the replacement property identified, it's pretty seamless, isn't it? Okay. What about a situation where you have a property that you're marketing at a half a million dollars, and I have a property that I'm marketing at half a million dollars, and maybe the half a million dollar valuation is predicated on the stars aligning, okay? And the sun setting perfect in a brilliant array of colors and the reality is that that property is worth 400,000 on both sides, okay? This is one of the few organizations that I come to where I can get up and I can present a property, whether it be for a client or myself, and, and my opening comment is this property is overpriced, okay? Why is it a benefit for me to acknowledge that in front of the room, okay? It's a benefit because once I've acknowledged and I put it out there, I'm still gonna get offers and they're gonna write their own value on it. Or maybe they are representing a client that has a property that's slightly overpriced and we can put together a deal together and we're doing it transparently. And if we acknowledge that and we talk about it up front, the chances of it going out of play in escrow due to an appraisal or due to some other mitigating circumstances are far less because we came right out and we said it, right? Okay. So don't be afraid to be completely transparent and talk about the hair on the deal, as I like to call it, okay? What are the problems with this property, okay? Because it's gonna help you work through and troubleshoot and solve these problems in the room, okay? I love this organization because there's a lot of people in that room that are smarter than me. And there is nothing better than surrounding yourself with people that have more experience in a certain area that you wanna put some focus on. What a great opportunity to learn and to grow, okay? So use that, okay? Very important. So let's start wrapping up how we do everything that we did in the first two steps of this, preparation and production, and talk about different strategies that we can use to turn this into revenue, to profit, okay? Uh, when is the conference over? Anybody? When's the conference over at this meeting? Never, never over, right. It's never over. I don't consider, because when I leave town, I don't know about everyone in the room here, but I get a hold of my builder who's doing a building project, and I get a hold of my clients, and I get a hold of different people in my circle of life that I'm currently focused on in business. And I tell people I'm gonna be out of town, okay? And I will be back operational in my office, okay? at about three o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday, okay? Now, I get home on Sunday, 
at about 7 p.m. So why do I tell everybody Tuesday? Okay, I tell everyone Tuesday because my conference isn't over until I've gotten home and done what you're about to see. Again, I want you to remember, everybody's got their own way of following up. Okay? I come from the old school. Okay? I don't understand the last two generations of people, most of which are my kids. Okay? <laughs> they got the technology, they got this, they got Twitter, they got this language that I haven't really learned that you're supposed to use when you text people. Okay? It's all computerized, it's all newfangled stuff, I don't get it. That's okay. okay? I got a method that works for me. You incorporate what I'm trying to drive at in your own method, okay? So my conference is really over for the purpose of the production side when I've gotten home, gotten organized, and completed, not started, completed my first round of follow-up, okay? Now, those of you that know me, and there's a number of people in the room that have been in this organization long enough, know that I'm really big on follow-up. Developed a bit of a reputation for that, okay? So, what do we do when the dust settles? We're back at home, we're past the jet lag, we're back in the office, we're trying to get organized, okay? So we're gonna start with what are my tools? My tools are, I'm gonna get to the office, I'm gonna open my book, and I, I love to call it dissecting the book, okay? So, I'm a big manila folder kind of guy, okay? I love little folders, I love organizational things, because I got a simple mind, okay? 70s and the 80s were kind of a rough cycle for me, so I gotta keep it simple, okay? So, I wanna get organized. So here's my desk in my office. I've got my binder, I've got my laptop, and you'll notice there's a bunch of folders up there. Your names are on those folders. Your number's right next to your name, okay? And then there's a whole bunch of scribble. Don't I have beautiful handwriting, okay? What's all this? So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to call you on the phone. And those of you that have a last name that start with A, you're the first ones I call. I just literally go through the alphabet, okay? So I dissect the book. I take the book, I take every package that you brought to the meeting, including the stuff that I got late, not in book, and I put it in that folder. I don't care if I offered on just one property or if I just expressed interest and I didn't even identify the property. Every one of your packages goes in that folder with your name and your number. I then write your phone number on the top of the folder, okay, on the front cover, okay? I then call you. You inevitably don't answer because you guys don't like picking up your telephone, okay? But I'm not gonna give up on you, okay? So what do I do? I leave you a message, I ask you to call me. I say, hey, I'm, I'm just calling to let you know that I'm, I'm gonna go forward and I'm gonna buy your property. Please give me a call. You gonna call me back? That's pretty simple, right? Yeah, you're gonna call me. Uh, but some of you don't, okay? And I'll tell you what to do in just a moment to that. So I, I get organized, I get in my office. I leave a message for you because you're not there, okay? Am I done? No. The next thing I do is I go to my master sheet that I created on Excel, and I go down to your name, and I click on your email address, and it opens an email. And I send you an email. Now, what's in that email? Great seeing you at the conference. Really great to uh, spend some time with you. I'm uh, backing up a phone message I just left for you on your package number 142-3. Uh, I wrote you a mini proposal, wanted to follow up. Uh, could you please send me backup on your offering? And please note attach the backup on the property that uh, I made reference to in my proposal. Look forward to hearing from you sincerely, Mike Lipster, okay? So I've done that. Okay. Now, all the, all the while, I'm writing notes on the front of your uh, folder. Okay. So, before I start that process, I'm looking through all the proposals. And I mentioned that I put every package in your folder, even if it was property that had nothing to do with my offer. Okay. Before I get on my calls, I make a list. I gave a presentation on a condominium in the Belgrade Mercantile Building where my office is located, where my wife's property management is owned and operated from. It's passive income producing property. Uh, I'm willing to take something as partial consideration. I'm going down and out, okay? But I'm willing to look at some land. And what am I offering you? I'm offering you passive management 
because CARE can manage that and everybody knows CARE is more organized than any of us could ever hope to be. So this makes good sense for you because I'm willing to take that $30,000 piece of land, okay, and balance with cash. If you catch me on a good day, I may be able to be your financing solution. I may be able to finance your uh, acquisition. Wow, take your land and I finance you. How good does it get, right? So I get a bunch of offers from, from everyone in the room and I'm gonna number those. What, what has the benefits that I'm really driving towards? I'm gonna move those to the top of the list. I'm gonna call those first because if I can get that done, I don't have to get over creative. I don't see smoke coming out of my ears. You know, I don't have to jump through hoops. Uh, it's real easy for me, okay? So I write down what I call my best in show, okay? This is, this is the, the short list of what I want to target, okay? All right. So I've initiated the follow-up. I've called you. I've sent you a backup email. I've sent you a PDF of my backup. I may send you APODs. I may send you a complete backup, okay? I've made my notes on the front of the uh, folder. And then, of course, every time I do that, I save that email that I sent you, okay? And I've, I'm building a file. And on my computer, if I was to show you, I could pull up any meeting, and I could pull up a history of every single email that I've sent to every single one of you, okay? I've got a complete record, and I keep that file. Why? Why do I do that, Chuck? I do that because I may not put a deal together, but I want to remember that because I was a taker for that property, right? And there may be a transaction that I want to go back and look at, okay? I have files going back 10 years on deals that I've done. And occasionally I revisit those, you know, I, I've got kind of a favorite folder of properties. It, just on the off chance that you may still own that property, okay? All right, so work in your files. So you got no contact. I've called you, you haven't returned my call, shame on you. Okay, I've sent you an email, you haven't, you haven't done anything. Amazingly, a week goes by and I still haven't heard from you. So I wash, rinse, and repeat. I email you, I phone you. Maybe I text you, okay? How many people in the room respond quicker to text than they do to emails, okay? Trick of the trade, guys. Try sending a text if you don't hear from somebody, okay? Uh, social media. How many of you post things on Facebook, okay? Great, go to Facebook and say, hey, saw your post, great picture, nice beach, call me. I've got a question for you, okay? When was the last time anybody received mail, i.e. hard mail with a postage stamp, okay? I've sent postcards as a method of follow-up. United States Postal Service. Hey, it's Mike, met you at the meeting. Uh, just wanted to thank you, it was nice getting to know you. Call me, please, okay? That's gonna leave an impression, isn't it? You get a postcard mailer from me, you're gonna go, oh, shoot. Uh, <laughs> if I could figure out how to do it on ham radio or use a carrying pigeon, I'd do that too. Because I know the second I get you on the phone, I'm gonna arrive at what? I'm gonna arrive at a yes and no or questions that need to be answered, right? Am I okay with a no? You bet, I can scratch you off the list and move on to the next guy. If you can't make it to a marketing meeting and I'm calling you to get you to register, or I'm trying to confirm with you whether you're coming, if you don't want to receive another call from me, call me back and tell me you're not coming. I can scratch you off the list and I don't have to think about you for three more months. Not that I don't love each and every one of you, okay? But that's one less thing I gotta do. If I haven't received a no or a yes from you, I will keep calling. Those of you that have been around a while know this about me, okay? All right, so I wash, rinse, and repeat, okay? So let's say everything falls apart. You don't call me. I really want your equity. I know I'm gonna see it to the next marketing meeting. How many people have come away with proposals, you go home, and for all the effort extended, you never receive a call back from the person you're trying to reach? Anyone ever have that happen? Am I the only one? No? Okay. All right, so what do I do when we get to that point of inflection? When's the point of inflection? The point of inflection for me is a couple weeks out from the next marketing meeting, right? So here's what I do. John, this is Mike. I've been trying unsuccessfully to reach you. This is a voicemail, right, regarding my purchase, not our exchange. 
regarding my purchase of your property, okay, uh, that I noted in the October book. As we're getting close to our upcoming January meeting, I'm closing out my October files. What is that? That is a time close, guys. I'm closing out my files. This means I'm about to throw you in the trash, okay? So I wanna reach out one last time to determine if we can put this transaction together because I wanna buy your property. If you do have an interest in selling, give me a call on my mobile, here's my number. If by chance I don't hear from you prior to my heading out this weekend or tomorrow to set up for the next marketing conference, um, I'll assume that you've gone a different direction or decided that you're not going to sell your property. I hope the session went well for you. Look for forward to seeing you at the next meeting, okay? If you get one of those messages from me, this is your come to Jesus moment, right? This is when you have to determine, okay, should I call them back and find out if this transaction works or not? Now, now, in, in your defense, in everyone's defense that falls into this category, you may have sold it and you may have just been raised with this idea that you just don't call people back unless you got something to talk about. I'm fine with that, okay? But from an efficiency standpoint, consider the courtesy, professional courtesy of communication, okay? Communication's key, right? If it's not a fit, tell me it's not a fit, okay? Because what we're trying to accomplish here in this room is we've got all these proposals on all these properties. Boy, what a great problem to have, huh? How many people in the regular brokerage community have way too many offers and they just don't know what to do with them all? Okay, I love when that happens, okay? This is kind of what happens with our group all the time, right? We've got a lot of proposals. We've got to weed through what the best one is, okay? All right. So now we're gonna talk about the big moment. In this, in this particular scenario, I'm representing the client, okay? Now I told you that one of the, the early objectives was I, I did some client counsel. I sat down with Joe and Mary and I said, okay guys, why are you selling this? What are your circumstances? What are you trying to accomplish? What are you looking to do with the money, okay? Or what are you looking for for property classification, blah, blah, blah. And I got my ammunition. Now I've come back and now I'm prepping to meet with my client because I've got eight offers, okay, for my client, okay? So what's the first step? Cardinal rule. Never assume what the client will like, what the client will want, or what the client will do. This is the cardinal rule, okay? I'll tell you a great story on this. Anyone in the room heard Ken Vidar's story on the sewage treatment plant? Anyone? Okay. So, Ken comes to a marketing meeting. He's representing a client, okay? He's presenting the property and he gets a bunch of takers. Comes home with basically eight different proposals, okay? And he numbers those, kind of like I was talking about earlier, number of the best in class, right? Be careful though if you're representing a client because what you think is the best deal may not be what they think. Okay, buyers and sellers have one very similar trait. What is it? They're liars. They don't know what they really want. They don't know what they want. They don't always have the ability to tell you what you need to hear. So don't make assumptions, okay? How about this? How about before I sit down with my client, I call the listing agent, I call the person that was proposing this and I make sure that that property is still available. There's, there's a good idea, right? So back to Ken. So Ken comes back and he sits down with the client and, and he's taught me a lot. He's kind of my, my mentor. And uh, he goes through this list. And here, here's, my, here's my favorite one, blah, 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 blah. This thing cooks breakfast for you on Friday. It turns off automatically, it turns on automatically. It'll mow your lawn, okay? It's maintenance free, as a matter of fact, the longer you own it, the shinier it gets. This thing is just the end all be all. This is the property that you want. And you can get rid of this arbitross around your neck. Okay, this is what you should do. But just for the exercise, let me go through each and every one. Okay, so he goes down the list. He's got this land deal. He's got this cash deal with this other stuff. He's got this building, he's got this. He gets down to the very last item. And it's a business, sewage treatment plant, okay? Sewage treatment plan, okay? So, he says, he, he, he does his job, he says, okay, he didn't ask, are any of these good enough for you? What did he ask? He says, which one of these fulfill the, the, the best solutions for you? Which one are we purchasing? 
which deal are we taking here? Assumption closed, right? Go back to your sales training, okay? Don't ask people if they wanna do stuff. Ask them how they wanna do which, okay? Keep it easy to understand. And, and part of this is stemming from client counseling, is it not? You kind of get to know what these people's tolerance level are, okay? So if these people have been of the earth, okay, living on their family farm, they go out each morning at five o'clock and they milk the goats. And when they're done with that, they till the fields. And they, they have a very simple life. They're not high tech, they're not high stress. They've got very simple objectives. Take them on that level. Boy, that sounds like a beautiful thing, right? Um, but let me close out Ken's story. So what do you think the client picked? Did he pick their number one? He picked this sewage treatment plant. Okay. Last thing that Ken would have thought that that client would have taken was a business. So he had to ask, why'd you pick the sewage treatment plant? And she looked at him, stared him straight in the eye, and says, everybody's got a poop. Okay. They saw the value and the revenue stream that was capable from that because they saw this as repeat business. Okay? Every time you eat something about 12 hours later, something has to occur. Okay? And guess what? You keep doing it your whole life. So they saw the benefit and Ken learned a valuable lesson that day. So back to the first thing, don't assume what the client's gonna like. You bring them everything, that's your job. Your job is to get proposals, go back to your client, present that, help them, nurture them, break it down, keep it simple, help them make the right decision, okay? Along the way, if possible, present in person. Why do I wanna present the options to you in person versus on the phone, anyone? In sales, you learn a very valuable tool. What'd you say, Hal? Read their eyes, read their behaviors. What is that called? That's called body language. Yes. I want to read your body language. When I'm talking to you in the hall, okay, and you're sitting here and I'm talking about a property opportunity, there's a lot of things going on with those 12 brain cells that I've got left, right? One of them is watching your body language. If you're looking away, if you're crossing your arms, okay, if you're looking down, if I don't have good established eye contact, if your posture changes, okay, I know how engaged you are in this. You can create emphasis, right? Hand gestures, assertion, inflection of voice. There you go, okay? So whenever possible, present in person. You're gonna know if they like it by their reaction a lot of times, okay? Have your backup ready to forward or share at the time of the presentation. There's a reason I ask you for your backup. Chances are good if I'm representing a client, they'd like to know. They'd like to know what the operating expenses are. So I am selling a commercial property and I'm willing to take partial consideration of this land that you're trying to move through. Why do you think it's important for me that I know what the HOA dues and what the property taxes are on that raw ground? Because I'm trying to figure out what's my carry cost. Now I'm speaking as a principal here, but is there any difference between me speaking as a principal and as a representative of a client? Do you think that your client's gonna wanna know what the carrying cost is on that property? You think it helps me much to know that this property grosses $100,000 a year, but I don't know what the operating expenses are? What kind of credibility have you established by not properly disclosing the performance of this property when I'm reviewing 10 different packages, okay? Again, guys, I've got 12 brain cells, okay? I'm gonna go path of least resistance. If I've got a package that has everything broken out for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at that with a lot more seriousness than something that requires that I get on the phone and ask about 15 minutes worth of questions. So think about disclosing that information. Have your backup ready to share at the time of your presentation. It validates, it, it establishes credibility, okay? Has anybody ever thought that their association to NCE, let me stop there, how many people do general brokerage in their own local community where they take listings and buy and sell properties for clients? Anybody? Okay, so you're not all full-timers. You do some of this, right? When you're competing with another agent for a listing, whether it be residential or commercial, and you go in and say, yes, I can do everything that, Jer that you know, the other five people that you interviewed can do, except I can do one more thing that they can't. I can deliver an audience of takers for your property based on the 
priorities and based upon the objectives that you've given me, okay, the reasoning behind your sale, and I can deliver a bunch of takers to you that they can't deliver. Because I'm associated with a group of principals licensed in about 35 different states that either represent clients or their principals that do business all over the country and they're takers potentially for your property. You think that has any ammunition? If I'm a seller and I'm hearing that additional caveat, that additional cherry on top of the cake, you bet it does, okay? It's, it's, it, you're offering a marketing service that nobody else in your market can offer. Use that in your presentation, okay? Reading body language, we talked about that. Show your work, uh, follow up, due diligence, okay? When I sit down with a client, I say, okay, I've gone through eight series of follow-ups and I had initially 24 proposals to show you. About 18 of those 24 didn't make the cut. Why didn't they make the cut? Because you instructed me certain restrictions that you had on this or certain objectives that you had to have followed and those didn't make the cut. And here's the stack of those. Okay, what am I showing my client? I'm showing my client that I'm doing a good job for them. I've really put some work into this and I've whittled it down to six polished gems and they get to pick one of those. Okay. And I'm, 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 by nature of my background, I'm in the sales, okay? I'm gonna show you six opportunities and you're gonna pick one. And you're gonna go forward and you're gonna go to contract because I've already gone through the process of getting you to that point by the time I sit down with you, okay? When I start, when, I'm, when the client comes in and I get them a cup of coffee and we're sitting at my table, I start by reviewing the objectives that they had set forth. I remind them what their, what their marching orders were for me, okay? Here's what you sent me to do. You identified blah, 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 blah. And why do I do that? Well, one is probably to remind them what they, uh, what they decided they wanted to do, right? But there's another thing. Has any of those changed? Has any of your objectives changed? Well, John, as a matter of fact, they have. I, I know I signed a listing with you, but I ran into so-and-so, and he said he'd like to buy the property, so I'd like you to write it up. You think that's gonna have an effect on some of these proposals that you're presenting? Yeah, probably is. Um, or maybe he left something out, and it helps steer you because he gives you that knowledge in your review towards a certain offering that best embodies what they're trying to accomplish. So I always review the pre-counseling objectives of the client. On the six choices that I'm giving them, I show, I show that client the benefits and how they satisfy those objectives. And then of course I go in for a trial close. Okay, I ask them for the sale, I ask them for the transaction. Okay? So we have exchange contracts, we have buy sales. Okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off script here a little bit. Okay? Corey, Corey Harper Road probably isn't here right now. Corey does this, I've done this a number of times. You wanna stand apart from your peers, right? That's why we put pretty brochures together. It's why you know when you get a proposal from me. Have you ever tried this? How many of you have gone past a proposal, you get home and you like this property so much that you type up a purchase and sales agreement, a regular buy sell, and you put that into a PDF and you email an offer. And here's what the email says. John, just wanted to send you a formal offer on the property you'd like to close in 45 days. Uh, please review and call with any questions. If it looks acceptable, please execute and uh, we'll get this under contract, okay? How do you think that's gonna stand out in relation to a bunch of these long or mini form offers, okay? Who else has an idea? Who else has an idea on how they stand out and how they use the tools of your business to close deals, to get deals? Anyone? Great, excellent, excellent tool. Everyone hear that? I'm putting together a contract. I wanted to check with you before I send it off to you to make sure that uh, there isn't something that I might be missing. Is there anything that you need incorporated due diligence time, blah, blah, blah. Next, Chuck? Uh, on exchanges, like there's an exchange that I see that we put together, I think about it as a buy sell agreement, but I don't do buy sell agreements that are contingent on each other. Right. 
Lenders don't understand exchange agreements, do they? No. Uh, either do title companies, do they? So a lot of times what Chuck just said, for those who didn't hear, is he'll type up two by cells and they'll make in the addendum to those, he'll make each of the performance of those conditioned upon the other so that there's a mutual simultaneous closing of that. Why is that? Because a regular buy sell is an instrument, a document, a language form that title companies and attorneys and others are familiar with. Exchange agreements, party A, party B, blah, 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 blah. A lot of people get confused on that. So that's a great tool. Who else? I saw somebody in the middle here. Anyone else having a secret tool that they use? Okay. All right, so obviously, when I sit down with my client, they're gonna have questions. We're gonna talk about those. And when you sense that they're on the fence, okay, when you sense that that deal is, is satisfying all the objectives, but they're having a hard time pulling the trigger, remind them that this isn't the end, okay? This is just getting them a step closer to cash. This is a, just getting them a step closer to their objective. If it's not satisfying 100%, of the check marks and it's the best thing that they've got let them know that this may be more merchantable if it's true okay let's keep it transparent let's keep it honest let's keep it real but if you know that this is a transaction this is a property that they can acquire through the disposition of what they have that is a lot more marketable with the next marketing meeting share that with them give them a bonus tell them you're happy to take that down and market that for them and continue this process Let's, let's see how big we can build this. Let's take this amount of equity and let's watch what can happen over the next five transactions, okay? And you may find that that helps get you over the fence line for some by reminding them that if this is better but it's not the end game, you acknowledge that, but this may still make sense to do, okay? Now, let's say that as presented, it's not quite there. They're in with you on the property, they like it. They like that it satisfies certain objectives, but there's just these two things they can't live with. Why is it that we can't just sit down and create a counter offer and get this done? We do it in real estate all the time. We can do it in an exchange proposal. What most don't realize is that those of us that have been in the business that haven't come to these meetings, have been doing what we do at these meetings since day one of their real estate career, okay? What is a cash sale and purchase? It's an exchange. I am exchanging a property for currency, okay? That's just another category. Everyone in this room has been doing exchanging for as long as you've been in real estate. It's just traditionally you've limited yourself to only cash and you put yourself in a box of only seeking and facilitating transactions that follow a certain pre-accepted method that you learned in real estate school when you got your license. Okay. All we're offering you here is the other 80% of the business that you've been neglecting for the last 30 years or however long you've been in real estate, okay? So keep in mind, you're already pros of this, you just gotta get out of that cash mindset and look at the benefits of structuring properties, okay? All right. Now, how do we bring this all home? So we start with an exchange contract. We found a deal, we put it together, okay? No difference in, in our transaction once you go to contract than any other contract. You're gonna identify the contingencies. I'm a taker for this, it's conditioned upon this, 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 and this. It's a contingency, you write it down, you sign it, you're good to go. Lending in banks, okay? One thing that I task my clients with before I'll present their property in a marketing meeting is I want a complete package, especially if it's commercial, guys. <clears throat> if I don't have an APOD and I don't have everything dialed in and I don't know the operating income and I haven't scrutinized that package, I don't want to present that package. Now, that's a luxury that I have that some people in the room may not have. Okay, it may be the only thing you have. But the more knowledge that you have and the more numbers that you have up front, the more that I know that I'm dealing with a client that is gonna be able to produce what is necessary to be favorable when that buyer goes to the bank looking for a loan. Okay, so I like, I like to see good financial, good package backup, copies of leases, okay? 
So we, we talked a little uh, through the first couple courses of this about what do I do with my deals that I received whereby Mike was a taker for the property, but I didn't like what he had, okay? So work in your B stack. In some cases, this can be better than one-to-one -one deals. When I say one-to-one, -one, what am I meaning? I mean, you have a property, I have a property, we're just gonna swap properties. That's a one-to-one -one deal, okay? As I tee up doing a three-way transaction, doing a multi-leg exchange, keep that cash and paper board that you get emailed at the ready because you may need to draw on that. I have IRA money in my Roth. Chris has money. Okay. People in this room have money. We just want a return. We want to deploy some short-term capital. You may be able to dip into that basket to help balance your transaction out. Okay. Better than not, not always do the equity and the loan and, and the EAT match up with one another. So you may need to bring in some third-party cash. The acquirer or the person acquiring your property may not have that cash. So we may need to dip into some available cash to make that happen, okay? So if the deal doesn't work, don't forget the most important thing. You have a taker. When I sent you a proposal, basically what I told you is I said, I want your property, okay? Now all you gotta do is figure out how to make this thing work, okay? Because maybe I'm the best step, but what I've got doesn't work for you, okay? So what do we do in that situation? We identify the other takers for the property that you were offered, okay? Does their property work for you? Now they may not wanna sell their property to you or exchange their property for what you have, but they may like what I have, okay? So what do we do in that situation? We assemble a three-way transaction. So in this scenario, this first exchanger, Manny, he wants some cash. He's got a residential condo. What does that mean? He wants some cash. That means he's going down and out, isn't he? In most cases, right? So he's looking for cash. This other exchanger here, Cassandra Cash and Kicker, wants some commercial income. Okay? She's got what he's looking for. She's got cash. She's got a couple lots as a must take, and she's got cash. Okay? Transaction balances. The problem is. What Manny has is not what Sandra's looking for. So what's the next step? So exchanger one, the condo, gets the cash and the lots, okay? What's she looking for, okay? She's looking for commercial income, right? She wants commercial income, says so right there. So so-and-so, exchanger three, Mr. Larry Loan Call, has a problem. He's got a commercial property, it's performing, Okay, but what's wrong? Bank called the loan. Loan's mature, doesn't have the money to pay it off. What's happened now? We're in equity preservation mode. Do you think he cares what he's taking? He's looking to, to capture his equity before the bank walks away with the whole shooting match, right? So, here what you've got is a three-way. Cassandra wanted commercial, so she's gonna get the commercial. The commercial just wants something for the equity, so he's gonna take that condo, okay? Heck, it may be a condo he can lease out and create some income off of, okay? And now you've got a three-way because Manny is gonna get his commercial income property, okay? A one-on-one -on -one transaction didn't work. In other words, general brokerage, right? It didn't work, okay? But through this creativity, through this problem solving, through this transparency and sharing and working together and collaborating, We've created a transaction that couldn't have been created in a typical one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Everybody got what they want, okay? I like that. So let's, let's kind of briefly cover what we've done here. We've got about 15 minutes, okay? So we've gotten organized, we've got a game plan, we've reviewed, we've previewed the book, we've come down, I've earmarked my pages, I've talked to my people, okay? Remember that this isn't just about getting your listing, getting your transaction. This is about building relationships. Take the time and invest in these people here. They're gonna feed you for years to come, okay? I'll bet there's a number of people in the room. Who, who in my room here has been doing this for at least five years? 
and C. Okay, real estate too. Same, it's 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 transferable. Okay. Is there anybody in this room that's done a transaction that they know to be a win-win, where they haven't had the opportunity to repeat? Okay, how many people have done more than one transaction with the same principles? More than two, multiple, many, yes, excellent. Okay, once you break the ice, you've now got somebody in your circle, you've got a partner. What I didn't tell you this morning before the break, when I spent two years setting up a business relationship with an investor, putting my focus on, on identifying the objectives of that client that was gonna be ultimately my partner, okay, is that because I took the time and because I structured things to accommodate what those needs were that he had, that resulted in what is probably now somewhere between 15, 17 transactions that I've done using him as a partner totaling over $20 million worth of business, okay? And it's because I took the time up front to really listen to my client and figure out what he wanted, okay? So does the, does the process work? Yes. Does it always work? No. But what does, okay? Take the time and extend the effort to do the very best you can do. Sometimes the transaction, if you're acting as a principal, for example, I've done deals, Chuck, you can probably echo this, I've done deals that didn't really satisfy the objectives, but they were still a good deal for me to do. Because I saw the benefit of that, not being specifically the property I acquired or the property that I got out of, but the relationship that I knew was gonna form through that process, okay? And I was able to utilize that and monetize that in other deals and get paid huge dividends, okay? Again, everybody in that room is smarter than me in some respect, okay? Why? Because you've spent your lifetimes dealing with a certain type of real estate or a certain background or a certain way of thinking that I haven't yet exposed myself to, okay? That I haven't really considered, okay? So there's benefit in me getting to know you because it's a tool in my tool belt. That's really what we're talking about here. It's not an end-all be-all. I'm not giving you the the magic elixir that if you follow each and every step of this is just going to automatically make you successful. But what I am adding, hopefully, is some tools for the toolbox that can help refine and mold. How many people have gone to uh, three or four marketing meetings and they haven't got a deal yet? Okay. Anyone? Wow, that's pretty good. Okay. So for those of us that have tried this for a while, okay, uh, I think, uh, is it Jim Wilson, Chuck? that tells this story, how long he went to marketing meetings before he did his first deal. You, ever, you never heard that? So I, I think it was Jim Wilson that did this. Jim gives us our uh, Introduction to Equity Marketing course, thank you. And uh, talks about all the, all the time he spent up front going to marketing meetings and he hadn't got a deal. And about the 10th or 11th event, he finally broke the ice. And he stopped counting at some umpteen millions of dollars worth of revenue derived from commissions. He stopped counting. Now this guy's been doing this a long time, okay? I could ask the question a different way. For those of us that haven't done a transaction yet, do you feel smarter today than you did the first time you came here? So sometimes it's just an evolution of thought process. Sometimes it's the inventory that you're working with. Sometimes it's the inventory you're not working with that you need to find, okay? Sometimes it's just trying to match it up, okay? People ask me, what's, what's the benefit of coming to all our meetings versus once a year or twice a year? And there is a benefit that differentiates whether you have something to present or not. When you're constantly in the room and you're constantly in front of the people and you're building the relationships, people are gonna remember you. Opportunities are gonna come up in this room that you didn't come here prepared to think that you needed. How many people came down here with a certain objective over the course of the last few years and did transactions that they had no clue, that they really hadn't prepared to do, that just fell in their lap. Okay, I've seen the lightning strike. Everybody, everybody that's been doing this a while has this. All my preparation, everything that I just spent the whole morning talking about here, out the window, half the time, because something comes along that I see, and I gotta have it, okay? So, 
you can do all this preparation, and yes, it's gonna help you get deals, but it's not the end-all be-all. Don't forget to keep your ears open. Stay in the marketing room, okay? Listen to the presentations. You have plenty of social time. My goodness, you got the first 30 days when you get home to relax and, and you know get your focus back and do what you need to do. Listen to those because inevitably it's Murphy's Law, okay? The second you leave the room in the middle of a presentation, it's gonna be the one, right? It's gonna be the one deal that you came here for, okay? The trader board helps, okay? But it's not the end all be all. All right, so I think I've, I think I've covered everything that I had set forth to cover, which is about 10% of, of what we really do. But is there any questions? Anybody at all? So I have, I have done my job. Everybody's done. Guys, thank you. Thank you.